so because of all these problems that were presented by the Articles of Confederation, it was pretty much determined amongst the American political class at the time that things weren't working out. And you can go read in the textbook uh, the details of why the Articles of Confederation wasn't working out. So they needed to write a new governing document that would address the concerns and the problems raised by the Articles of Confederation. Now, we all are at least somewhat familiar with the story of the Constitutional Convention, or at least we're aware that there was a Constitutional Convention. And again, you can read about this in further detail in textbook, but in order to garner support for the newly written document in the aftermath of the Constitution, a group of founders wrote a series of papers referred to as the Federalist Papers in order to garner support for the Constitution. These were essentially a series of arguments on how the current or this newly drafted Constitution would make up for the deficiencies of the Articles of Confederation. Now, though it's not required, I did put in the syllabus that I recommend you go read Federalist 10 and 51, uh, because I think that reading those will provide a very thorough understanding of some very uh, basic concepts that the founders were very concerned with. Now, Federalist 10 is very interesting because it did not necessarily deal with governing institutions. It dealt with what uh, the founders were, uh, what the founders felt was a very serious looming issue, and that was factions, or as we would call them today, political parties. They, this is speaking to their experience under the British Empire, where political parties cause all sorts of uh, dysfunction in the British Parliament, uh, they went so far as to call it the root of all evil in Federalist 10, a group united and actuated by some common impulse of passion or of interest adverse to the rights of other citizens. I mean, that's quite an accusation, right? Uh, political parties care little for the rights of other citizens. They only exist to, call, to further some common impulse of passion. I mean, that just sounds like it's, it's dirty business, doesn't it? So the solution that they offer is that uh, there are three ways you could potentially uh, quell the problem of factions. The first would be to just remove factions, ban them. And there's only two ways you could do this. Neither one is very feasible. Just destroy liberty, destroy freedom of association. Or you could design the system in such a way that everybody has the exact same interests. Well, destroying liberty goes against the principle of the very founding of the nation, and you're never going to get anybody, any cross-section of Americans, to all agree that they have the same interests at hand. Uh, anybody who has ever attended a family reunion knows that you can't even get people who are related to each other to agree on common interests. Uh, heck, you know, try getting a group of friends to decide where you're going to have dinner and leaving it up to uh, people to just throw things out there. It's not going to happen. Uh, so they, in Federalist 10, suggest that factions are inevitable. It's part of human nature. Um, but there are things you can do Two, in fact, that they propose in order to mitigate the problems caused by factions. One is to make sure that nobody is the judge of their own cause, which means that you can't put a person who is advocating on behalf of some group or is a leader of some group or faction into a government position where they are capable of implementing uh, policies solely in the interests of their own faction. And also, they suggested that the sheer size and complexity of a vast republic like the United States would mitigate the effect of factions because there would ultimately be so many 
that no one faction would ever be able to rule all of the others. Federalist 39 uh, looks at the federal state relationship. This really gets at uh, the concern that was caused under the Articles of Confederation that it, there was too much imbalance between the national and state government. Now here they probably had a lot of resistance amongst the public because the idea of a strong national government was anathema to the sensibilities of the average American citizen during the founding days because of their experience under the British. They were used to their own state governments uh, being able to make policy decisions for their own citizens, and they resented the idea that a strong national government, whether it be in London or in uh, Philadelphia, New York, which were the early capitals of the day, um, they did not like the idea that somebody from outside of their state could tell them what laws to follow. And so Federalist 39, uh, argued that under this new constitution, there was this good balance between the federal and the state governments. You couldn't have uh, a weak federal government because the states would end up competing against each other because of varying interests. However, a republic, it argues, derives power from the population and is represented by many electorates. The constitution itself would be ratified by the states. And at an operational level, there was still quite a bit of power amongst the states. The states could amend the constitution uh, and the states could, uh, could mitigate the power of the national government. And so they came up with a system of reserved powers as shown here, I won't go through all of them, but there are enumerated powers which are specific powers mentioned in the Constitution itself that are given to the federal government. There are particular powers that are specifically denied to the federal government. There are then the state powers, which are the reserved powers, those powers that, reser that are reserved specifically to the states. And again, also denied powers to the states, those that the states cannot participate in and can only be exercised by the national government. Then there are concurrent powers. And these are powers that are shared by both the national and state governments or powers that can be exercised at either the national or the state level. And it's basically Federalist 39 in action. Federalist 51, however, looks solely at the institutions at the national level. Again, there was great concern about amassing too much power at the national level. And what Federalist 51 argued was that if you divide the national government into three separate branches, three separate and competing branches that can check each other, that ambition uh, would be quelled because there was always some other entity at the national level that could check the power and ambition of other office holders people would be ceding, consequently, some amount of power to competing governments, or rather competing government entities. And that because of that, there would be a safeguard to minority interests because no one office holder would dominate uh, the national powers. And here is just that, that organizational structure in visual form. Uh, Congress, judiciary, the president, all have the ability to check each other. Uh, Congress can potentially impeach or uh, otherwise uh, mitigate the powers of the president. Uh, president can veto acts of Congress. President appoints members of the judiciary, and those appointments have to be confirmed by Congress, and in turn, the judiciary can declare acts of the Congress and of the president to be unconstitutional should they deem it appropriate. 
Now I want to talk about some lesser known Federalist Papers that I think are important for you to know about. Federalist 57 talks about who can gain office. This is where we get more into politics rather than governance. Again, this is something that's speaking to their concern under the British and to some extent uh, under the Articles of Confederation. Again, a lot of concern that there would be too much power at the national level and that it would be at the expense of the state governments. What Federalist 57, however, argues is that uh, people who seek office, those who hold the public trust, uh, will ultimately be, be, be mitigated because of the necessity of having to run in multiple elections. Uh, the necessity of expressing the preferences of their fellow citizens in order to be successful in those continuous elections. The honor that is bestowed upon them in maintaining those elected positions and ultimately, and perhaps most importantly, the laws that these policymakers pass would have to apply to themselves as well. And it seems irrational that an office holder would pass a law that they themselves would not want to follow. Federalist 62 is interesting because it actually advocates a position in the Constitution that no longer exists. Again, this concern for federalism and state powers. Not only were a lot of people concerned about too much power being amassed at the national level, people were fairly concerned about the people themselves getting too much power. The citizenry, the unwashed masses, uneducated, or God forbid, poor, non-property owners. At least this was the attitude of the time. And so though there was the popular chamber, uh, the US House of Representatives, and by popular I mean determined by uh, the US population, uh, Federalist 62 argues not to worry, there will be an upper chamber that represents the will of the states, the Senate. They will be chosen, in fact, by members of the state legislature. Now, of course, this was later done away with by constitutional amendments. Senators are now popularly elected. But the argument was that even though um, there was a, a chamber of Congress that was determined by population, there would be another chamber where all states were represented equally and would have longer terms, thus, uh, thus would have more stability. And the reason why this is important is because there was concern amongst smaller, lower population states that they would never get a fair shake if the Congress was determined solely by population. So the US Senate was a way to mitigate those concerns. Federalist 69 is about constraints on the executive. And it argues not to worry, the president will become another king. Uh, but we do need a president because we saw that a lack of leadership under the Articles of Confederation was a serious problem. We need some kind of executive in order to coordinate. However, this position will be constrained by having to run for re-election every four years. In the original constitution, there were no term limits that would be added uh, later on in the 20th century. If he were to commit high crimes and misdemeanors, uh, he could be impeached by Congress. Yes, he would get to veto legislation, but Congress could override that veto with a two-thirds vote. Yes, he commands the military, but not the state militias, which could be maintained by the state governors. He has limited pardon power, and he can make treaties with foreign governments, but those treaties do have to be confirmed by the Senate.